Okay, welcome to video number two of lecture 19, where we're going to cover the rules of thumb regarding the design of a ground heat exchanger for a ground source heat pump system. Okay, today we're only going to cover rules of thumb. We're not going to talk about equations or um, basic models of the heat transfer. We're just gonna talk about, uh, essentially provide a plot at the end. That is the plot you use to determine the length of your ground heat exchanger. Also, we're going to work in English units um, because that is how the HVAC industry works in the United States. Okay, so we have some goals. What we're trying to accomplish here is we want to create a ground heat exchanger, make it long enough so that it provides 25% more heating or cooling than the load, which would be the amount of heating or cooling you require in your home. Um, so the, the amount of heat exchange between the ground and the working fluid should be 25% larger than the heating or cooling load that you have in your home. That is our goal. Okay, before we get to the actual rules of thumb, we need to talk about some terminology. Number one, you're going to hear um, the amount of heating or cooling listed as tons. So like that's a one ton system or a three ton system, which is related to the amount of heat moved. Okay, it's the heat rate. And this is kind of an older term that uh, what it means is it's the rate of heat that's necessary to freeze one ton or 2,000 pounds of water held at zero degrees Celsius, so um, atmospheric pressure. So this kind of goes back to the early days of HVAC. And really, whenever you hear one ton, you can just think of, think of it as three and a half kilowatts. I know I said I'd work in English units, but I just can't bear myself to write BTUs. So three and a half kilowatts. Think of one, when you see one ton system, it's one that can provide three and a half kilowatts of heating or cooling, depending on what mode you're in. We're also going to hear the word circuit. Okay, a circuit is a single fluid loop. So one fluid loop uh, connected to a heat pump. So you could have multiple circuits from a heat pump going into the ground. So if this is our heat pump and this is the ground, we could have one circuit and another circuit. And these run in parallel, so fluid is moving through both circuits simultaneously. So this is a circuit. And you can have multiple circuits running on one heat pump. And uh, you know the reason you'd wanna do this is to be able to move more fluid at once without having to say make your heat exchanger as long. Uh, there's kind of a play here of how many circuits you have versus how much fluid you need to move. We won't get as much into that design. Again, these are basic rules of thumb. But that's what when we say circuit, that's what we mean. All right, so let's get into the actual rules of thumb. Okay, I'm gonna give some ranges here. Uh, so like when I say, how deep should this be? You'll see a range from 150 to 300, for example, or something like that. Um, and so, those ranges reflect soil conditions. So when you have the worst possible soil, which would be loose gravel, right? So imagine a pipe going into the ground for vertical heat exchanger, surrounded just by loose rocks, right? So these rocks don't have very good heat transfer. The thermal conductivity of your medium of your soils can be pretty low because there's not a lot of actually good contact here. And so, if that's the case, then you use the worst case number. You'll have to kind of use your intuition to figure out what your worst case number is. For example, if I say the depth of a borehole should be 150 to 300 feet, then you would know that you need it deeper in order to get the most amount of heat transfer because your soil is not as effective. Now, when would you use 150 feet? Well, that's when you have your best soil for heat exchange. That would be 
what we're going to call saturated earth. So that's a vertical heat exchanger or horizontal surrounded by very um, well, I don't want to say compacted, but um, earth that is saturated with water. And so what that really means is the earth moves easily and it's well compacted and a very nice medium for the efficient transfer of heat out of our heat exchanger. So in that case, we would need a borehole that's 150 feet deep. So you see, uh, based on the condition, you can figure out which number to use. So when we have our best soil, use the best case number, which is usually the smaller number when we're talking about how big to make a heat exchanger. The smaller it is, the less heat transfer. Um, but if we have better soil, we get more heat transfer per unit length of heat exchanger. Okay, so we're going to go through this by borehole type. So rules of thumb for a vertical borehole. Okay, remember those are boreholes where we draw, we drill fairly deep and then put in what we call a U-tube, right? A tube that goes down and then up and fluid goes in and out of that tube. Okay, so if you have more multiple boreholes, um, which you probably will, the boreholes should all be 15 feet apart minimum. And it's better if it's 20 feet. So if we look down on, looking down from the sky to ground heat exchanger, if you're gonna drill multiple boreholes, all of the distances between every borehole should be 15 feet. And that's because, you know, as heat leaves a borehole, it's gonna heat up the ground immediately around it or cool the ground depending on what mode you're in. And if you have another borehole right next to it, that impacts the ability of that borehole, um, really all the boreholes to transfer heat as effectively. So you want them some distance apart. Okay, now your boreholes, you want to be 150 to 300 feet deep. Um, you want them nice and deep because really the, the most effective ground you're going to get to is the ground that is pretty deep down. About 30 feet into the ground we see variation in temperature but below 30 feet the temperature is essentially the temperature, the mean temperature of the air um, in your region and that's where we have the most, uh, where it behaves the same over the entire year. So a nice deep borehole really taps into this region right here. Okay, uh, we also want no more than one ton of cooling or heating, I'll just write CH, per borehole. Borehole. So that's about how much we want to get per borehole. Okay, and then, so for this rule of thumb, just assume you can have one ton of cooling or heating per borehole, um, as long as you've followed the depth uh, requirement. Okay, now in order to get that, you want a fluid flow of about three gallons per minute per ton of cooling. So your volume flow rate of your fluid in entirety should be three gallons per minute per ton of cooling. And we have one ton of cooling and heating per borehole. So you could almost say you have three gallons per minute per borehole, since there's one borehole, borehole per one ton of cooling and heating. Okay, finally you want your pipe diameter of the pipes in your boreholes to be about one inch. And that's for the U-bend pipes. And this this flow rate mixed with this diameter gets you so you have just barely turbulent conditions, which is what you want. If you have barely turbulent conditions, you have the most effective heat transfer. Um, you've increased your pumping, uh, um, the amount of work you need to do to pump a little bit, uh, but that's why you don't want to make very turbulent conditions. It increases your pumping work a lot without increasing your heat transfer very much. All right, so that's a vertical borehole. All right, now let's talk about rules of thumb for a horizontal trench. Horizontal trenches are, by definition, not as effective um, 
as vertical boreholes, uh, but they are a lot cheaper. Okay, so there's two kinds of trenches you can have. There's what we will call slinky style, right? Which is where if we look down, here's our house, and here's our manifold going out, bringing the fluid to the ground heat exchanger. It goes into the ground. Then we have one kind of going like this, overlapping. And then we bring it back. So that's slinky style. Or we can have just a straight style. Right, where we bring out our fluid, put it into the ground, and then we just lay this down in trenches. And once we are, have enough heat exchange, we go back. So straight style and slinky style. Okay, now one important thing is you can put multiple pipes multiple straight pipes in one trench. So let's say we build a trench like this. We dig a trench in the earth. Uh, so kind of what that trench would end up looking like is this. So we have a pipe on one side of the trench and another pipe on the other side of the trench. And this is all going to be filled in. And so really we're, we've dug two pipes into the earth uh, with one go with the backhoe. Uh, using that same uh, kind of way of thinking, we could, in theory, put up to six pipes in a trench, um, as long as our trench is big enough, so that we can uh, make the most use of our backhoe. Okay, the slinky style, uh, we're just going to, if we look down on a trench, we'll just lay down the pipes throughout the width of the trench like this. Okay, so let's talk about straight style real quick. There's a few different ways we can do this, depending on how many pipes you want to put in a trench. All right. Okay, so um, if we have one or two circuits, remember we talked about circuits, so independent um, loops then we can lay those down in a trench like this. And again, these could be the same circuit or two different circuits laid in the, in the same trench. And we want those to be at least two feet apart. We want four to six feet deep trenches. That's at a minimum. And you want seven feet between trenches. Okay, and then you can also lay if you don't want to dig as wide of a trench you could also lay them down like this just make sure they are two feet apart in that direction okay alternatively we can also do um for two to four circuits pipes like this where these need to be two feet apart and one foot vertically spaced. We need eight feet between trenches and we're going to follow the same depth requirement for all of these. Okay, and then we could stack them like this where we have at least one feet between each pipe. So again, this is, here's a trench and these are pipes going through our trench and I'm just giving you kind of the basic spacing you need to make sure you have good decent heat transfer okay alternatively you could have four to eight circuits I'm sorry four to six uh, which is gonna look something like this we stack three where by the way this four to six foot deep would be the depth down to our first pipe Okay, and here we're gonna want 10 feet between trenches. As we add more pipes, kind of the amount of heat we're pushing through one unit length gets bigger and bigger, and so we're gonna have a bigger temperature gradient going out, and we need a greater distance so that those trenches don't impact each other. Again, we need two feet between and one foot there. We could also lay them like this 
And here, actually, we want them two feet apart and one foot spaced like this. Okay, so that's how you would lay down multiple pipes. Um, and you do want multiple circuits going through here uh, just because, you know, you could have, you know, if it's one circuit, some water going in and then some water going out, or if it's two circuits, water going in at the same point. And what's nice about that is then the water here is at the same temperature if you do two circuits. If you do one circuit and the water coming in is not the same as the water going out and they might impact each other more than you would like. So if you're going to lay down multiple pipes, you want to make sure you get as many circuits in there as you can, although it's okay to, you know, have at least one pipe that's going in and coming back out. All right, so that's um, straight style. Okay, so now let's talk about... Mm, pen's freaking out, sorry. The length of a borehole. Okay, so here I've given you kind of v-plot. You can access this as the PowerPoint on Isidore, or you can just look at it on this video. And this gives you, in the y-axis, the length of your trench that you need. This is in feet. Sorry, I'm not sure why my pen decided to freak out. Um, or the depth of your bore per ton of heating and cooling. Okay, and then the way we're going to determine that is by using the average ground temperature given in Fahrenheit. Okay, and and just as a reminder, the average ground temperature, there we go, is just equal to the average air, t, air temperature over the year. So for example, for Dayton, you could take the TMY3 data, this is what you have to do on your homework, and you average the temperature, which is reported as dry bulb for an entire year, remembering it's given in Celsius, and this plot, you need it in Fahrenheit, but you could average this dry bulb column for an entire year, convert that to Fahrenheit, and you'll find the average ground temperature in Dayton. Okay, so that's how you would find the average ground temperature, which is applicable to about 30 feet deep is when the temperature is actually this the entire time. The higher you go above 30 feet, then you start to see seasonal variation. Obviously, we're going to see that seasonal variation since we talked about here trenches that were, you know, four to six foot deep um, down to the first pipe. And so, you know, we're going to see a lot of that seasonal variation the deeper you go. Uh, the better you have a more constant temperature. That's why vertical boreholes are just better. Okay, so what you do is you find your average ground temperature, um, and then you go to that point, and you just go vertically, and you pick your style of trench, whether it's slinky, six pipes per trench, four pipes, two pipes, or... A vertical borehole and this will tell you the length of your trench or your borehole per ton of cooling okay and this is the length of your trench not the length of your pipe just remember that for some things like a vertical YouTube um, the borehole depth will be twice the length of pipe right because your you your borehole goes down and your tube goes up and then down and then up uh, for something like a trench with six pipes in it, that means you need six times the length of pipe as the length of your trench. Okay, so this is the plot that you should use in order to determine the length of your trench or borehole. This is again provided on the PowerPoint associated with this lecture, or you can just read it right off this video. All right, so that's the very basic rules of thumb. Again, not a lot of detail here. Validate your designs with more rigorous models, but this gives you just a basic idea of how much of your yard you're going to have to dig up.